Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Acts chapter 17, here's what it says. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths, every Saturday for three weeks, reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ, this is the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ, or is the Messiah. So see, this is the contention with Jews, unbelieving Jews, that they see the prophecies about the Messiah. They know that the Messiah is supposed to come. But what they did not see is passages like Isaiah 53, 5. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we're healed. That chapter shows a suffering servant. And somehow they overlooked that the Messiah was going to come and suffer and die for their sins. So they're looking for the champion, the, the world ruler who's going to dominate the enemy and elevate the Jewish people. Well, that is coming. That's the second coming. But the first coming, he came to die and he came to take care of sin. So, verse 4, and some of them were persuaded. So when Paul was making this case and showing them in the Scriptures that there were prophecies that clarified that Jesus is the Messiah, he fulfilled prophecies. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious. Oh, ho, ho. Why did they become envious? Because Paul is having crowds. Why would you choose your doctrine based on envy of crowds as opposed to whether or not it's true? Oh, this is deadly. And it says, But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, in other words, people who are willing to lie and do whatever they have to do, to, to create fake news, if I could use a contemporary term. They took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down. I love that, by the way, that the gospel <laughs> was said to have turned the world upside down. These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason, was harbor Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Now, that is a talking point that is supposed to be uh, sort of a uh, a nail in the coffin because nobody can buck Caesar and Roman leadership. So when they say these men are acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, now everybody says, oh, you don't do that, right? So watch this. And saying there is another King Jesus. In other words, they're trying to make it sound like the gospel is preaching that we have another king named Jesus. We don't have to follow and listen to Caesar because we have a new king of our own, Jesus. Well, that's not what they were saying. And it goes on in verse 8 to say, And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city uh, when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest of them, uh, and then the rest, they let them go. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Why? They had to sneak them out. 
of the city. When they arrived, uh, when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These in Berea, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. These people, instead of being envious of the crowds, they said, let's look in the Bible and see if what you're saying is true. And they searched daily, 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 and guess what they found out? What you're saying is true. It's right there in black and white in our own Bible. Verse 12, therefore many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. In other words, Paul was such the prominent speaker that once they sent him away, then the criticism died down and Silas and Timothy could continue to teach the word there. Uh, they were more flying under the radar. Verse 15, So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. This man just gives his life day and night. He's out there preaching the word and finding people who will listen to him. Verse 18, Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seemed to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of what you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what, thing, what these things mean. Watch this. Here's a little commentary. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or hear something new. This culture just loved to hear about whatever new doctrine or philosophy or whatever. They just loved it. And so they're either telling something or they're hearing something. That was their, that was their pastime, so to speak. Verse 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing uh, through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one who, whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. To you. Oh, this is, this is wisdom of the Holy Spirit on Paul's part. He sees all these altars and statues and everything, but he finds an altar that says to the unknown God. And he says, oh my goodness, that's my God. That's the creator of heaven and earth. So he said, this is the God that I'm proclaiming to you. Well, what did it just say? It said, these people spend their time in nothing else than to hear something new. And Paul's saying, I've got something new for you. So he's got their attention. Verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. Boy, there's a good scripture against racism right there, isn't it? That creator God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the earth, uh, on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, by the way, don't let that be mistaken or confused with being children of God. In other words, we're all created by God, but that doesn't make us part of his family. You have to be born again by the blood of Jesus to be part of God's family. But we are his offspring. We are his creation. See, so don't say 
to the world, to unbelievers. We're, we're all children of God. That's not so. No, sin separated us from God. And Jesus and his salvation brings us back into the family of God. But we are offspring or creations of God. Verse 29, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him, the man, who is it? Jesus, by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Why? Because we love to hear new things, right? We'll hear you again on this matter. Verse 33, so Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them Dionysius and Arape excuse me, the Arapagite, a woman named Damaris and others with them. So a few, you know, we get the impression that it's a handful of people believed. So he goes through all this, the altar of the unknown God, and guess what? Not a whole lot of people came to the Lord that day. But we got a few. A few who were headed to hell, and now they're headed to heaven born again, baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and now walking with the Lord. And who knows who is going to be winning other people to the Lord. And that's the way we ought to be. Even if we just get one, the Bible says all of heaven rejoices over one person who repents and comes to the Lord. I just love the fervency. I love the, uh, the tenacity, the relentlessness, the perseverance of all these apostles, and particularly, of course, the Apostle Paul. All right, I'll see you tomorrow for chapter 18.